Hi there, and welcome, friends. My name is Gideon Rose. I used to be the editor of Foreign Affairs, and now I'm a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. And I have time. Uh, our full title is How to Meet the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, uh, at which we've fallen behind on naturally, uh, as everybody kind of expected in some ways, but uh, uh, such is life. Uh, we, we've been in this rodeo before and we'll get back. And the question is how and what have we learned? We have an extraordinary panel. Uh, Michelle Bachelet, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, uh, Paul O'Quist Kelly, the Minister, Presidency of, uh, Minister of Presidency and National Policies of Nicaragua. Sanda Odiambo, Executive Director of the UN Global Compact, um, uh, and Abdul Ghaffur Mohammed, the Foreign Secretary of the Maldives. And uh, 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 Michelle and Abdul will be with us uh, via video, uh, and uh, uh, Paul and, and Sanda will be here uh, with us in person, and uh, we'll get a chance to, uh, to talk with them. So uh, let's first go with our live uh, uh, guests and, and let's go, Sanda, let's go with you first. Um, what have we learned and what are the problems that are facing us because of this awful, crazy year that has set back our already sort of sluggish development efforts globally? Uh, and where do we go forward? Over to you. You can unmute yourself now and I will mute myself for a while. Great. Thank you, Gideon. And, and what a great and reflectful question. You know, I'm sure that each one of us has learned so much in our individual spheres. But what we know for sure is we are an interconnected world. And I think this is probably one of the most unique moments where the entire world has been focused on a singular issue. I mean, COVID has affected us uh, irrespective of your economy size, your geography size, um, and, you know, just, you know, what it is that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. But let me put it at, at a macro level. I think what, what I think we have learned over this past year is that we were in a state of slow momentum around the achievement of the sustainable development goals, these goals that were designed in 2015 to look at, you know, prosperity to look at peace and to look at planet, you know, for, for the world and for humanity. And I think what COVID did is actually going to be very useful in terms of how we approach the next 10 years of the Sustainable Development Goals trajectories. It has brought to the surface, I think, what are some of the key global issues that we must address together. And by we, I mean business, and I sit here represent you, speaking from a business perspective, government, the UN, civil society. I think the challenges ahead of us are clearer now more than ever. We must address the economic inequalities that exist. We must address issues such as access to healthcare and access to social safety nets. We must address the climate crisis. We must address inequalities. It is all very clear. So COVID, I think, has provided us a new reflection point, a reset point, a way to really galvanize uh, you know, focus around sustainable development. But I think also most importantly, I think COVID has shown us that no one problem or this problem cannot be solved by a singular entity. We need government to work together with business or the private sector, civil society, and the United Nations. We also need a multilateral approach to what we do. This is not going to be a, a series of, of issues that will be challenged through unilateral or singular approaches. So if anything, I go back to my first point, it has shown us how interconnected we all are at the individual level, but certainly at the institutional level. Thank you. And Sandra, let me actually take a follow up with you before turning to Paul on that point, because the the we talk about COVID and we've all, one of the weird things about this weird year has been that we've all experienced the same phenomenon, but we've also experienced it through our own unique prisms and differences. And so we've all had a common experience, but that common experience has reflected our individual differences. Uh, and the developed world and the developing world, have they experienced COVID the same ways? How, what has the effect uh, can you briefly say, for those who have been so preoccupied with the developed world's COVID problems, what has been the impact on the development effort of the past year of the pandemic, briefly? 
How far have we set things back and where uh, what what summarize the impact of the of COVID on development briefly? <laughs> sure, and I'm purely going to summarize it here and, and be very general. I like the fact that you just juxtaposed the the impact of COVID on the developed versus the developing world. In many ways, you know, I sit here, I'm actually from Kenya. When I got my role, I was sitting in Nairobi, Kenya. And at that point in time, uh, you know, where COVID had evolved and the impact of it then was it was more of an economic crisis than a health crisis to some extent. And we've all seen the numbers, you know, the, the numbers of those impacted for which I have extreme empathy have been primarily more in the developed world than in the developing world. But because of the impact of economic shutdowns, of lockdowns, of, of slowdowns in trade and in movement, it's meant that for many countries, what they felt first were the economic effects of a disease that they hadn't hardly seen yet. Truth be told, it probably allowed a little bit of a buffer to, to bring the health system up to scratch to respond. But I think what we then saw first was a collapse of some very critical sectors of the economy or adverse impacts on those sectors, on the SME sector, on the informal sector, on uh, income earning opportunities for women, um, on access to credit, on a whole number of things, which really makes the economic regeneration even harder. And so I'd like to say, you know, COVID has always, you know, sort of been between the two poles of a health crisis and an economic crisis. And it played out differently in both, part, both parts of the world, in my view. But what does it mean for the development response, as you said? Again, the development response will not be singular. Um, you'll still need to come in with a health response where needed. You'll need to come in with economic stimulus packages, as we've seen. You'll need to address the gaping inequalities that the crisis has raised. I think the development response will still remain to be multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral. Thank you very much, Sonda. Uh, Paul, you've been in the thick of this. I can't imagine anybody I'd rather hear from uh, your take on everything we just talked about and those questions. What is what has happened? How has it been? And what uh, what comes next? And what have we learned? Well, the world is in an emergency situation. The UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, informs us that the GDP of the region fell by minus 7.7% 7 .7 in 2020. The number of poor increased to 209 million, the same level of 12 years ago, and the extreme poor now totaled 78 million, the same level as 2001, 20 years ago. The hegemonic neoliberal social contract that produced the hyper concentration of wealth before the pandemic is incapable of unwinding even greater inequality post pandemic. By the 2007-2009 financial crisis, neoliberalism had lost its capacity to redistribute or reform, it, reform itself. That was not always the case. After the long depression that ended in 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act broke up the largest monopolies in the world, Rockefeller's oil, Carnegie Steel, and Harriman's railways. The progressive income tax followed the 1907 financial crisis. Social Security began major redistribution during the Great Depression that began in 1929. But after the 2007-2009 financial crisis and the ensuring Great Recession, Dodd-Frank and Basel III were about preventing the need to bail out banks, not redistribution for economic equilibrium and social equity. This led to market concentration without government redistribution to the 1% controlling 82% of the world's wealth. The difference now is the lack of fear. Lack of fear of reformists, the labor movement, socialists and communist parties, and the left in general, after the demise of the Soviet world and the subsequent expansion of globalized capitalism. To get out of this, clearly we need a new social contract. Nicaragua, since 2007, with the leadership of President Comandante Daniel Ortega and now Vice President Rosario Maria, Murillo, has been constructing a new social model based on inclusion of the historically excluded by the racist, classist, sexist oligarchy. Redistribution measures include universal free health care and education, and subsidized urban and interurban transport, 
as well as poor families receiving free roofing materials. In 2007, half the homes had electricity, now 99%. Inclusion, redistribution, participation, protagonism, empowerment, and voluntarism are the elements of the new social model. Given time restrictions, I will only cite two more examples as well as two obstacles. One example is the Caribbean coast and its indigenous and Afro-descendant populations historically relegated by the racist oligarchy. Two autonomous regional governments now manage health and education and the ancestral lands have been delimited and titled with 23 territorial governments controlling more than 37,800 square kilometers of land and their resources. That is more than the Kingdom of Belgium. A second example is gender in terms of inclusion. Nicaragua was 90th in the gender gap index of the World Economic Forum of Davos in 2007. Now it's in fifth place, only behind Iceland, Norway, Sweden, and Finland. Nicaragua is first among all developing countries in the index, as, for, as well as first in women in cabinet in Latin America with 58%, and third in the world. Six in the world for women in parliament, 47%. The municipal councils are 50-50 by law. The greatest female economic advance is among poor women. The zero hunger and zero usury programs consist of the capitalization of poor women through their own activities. The two, act, the two obstacles both have to do with political interventions in sovereign states. In Latin America and the Caribbean in this century, there have been eight coup d'etats or attempted coups. In Venezuela, 2002, Haiti, 2004, Honduras, 2009, Ecuador, 2010, Paraguay, 2012, Brazil, 2016, Nicaragua, 2018, and Bolivia, 2019. Each and every one of these coups and attempted coups was against, against a left-wing or progressive government. They represent a macro intervention in Latin American politics against the governments that most support the Sustainable Development Goals. The second set of obstacles are illegal unilateral coercive measures. Once again, they are directed in Latin America and the Caribbean against left or progressive governments that most support the SDGs. In times of pandemic, their illegality is elevated to the level of crimes against humanity. I would like to finish by emphasizing the call of UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez for a worldwide ceasefire in this time of emergency. This is urgent. A ceasefire in wars and armed conflicts, as well as in economic and political aggression designed to destabilize countries and provoke coup d'etats. Rather than fighting among ourselves, the human family has much better things to do, like the fight against deadly pathogens and global climate change, as well as the fight against accelerating poverty and extreme inequality through a new social contract that can achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. That's my take on it, Gideon. Uh, Minister, that was extremely eloquent and extremely sensible and uh, uh, extremely persuasive. Uh, so thank you. Uh, my uh, 200 uh, uh, development for two, Mike, that raises questions for about what development we're talking about as we go back afterwards and can we build development back better uh, uh, or rather than just go to the same question, which I want to get to after the we hear from uh, uh, our videos. But first, let me take you for 200. Uh, we've I've been discussing Nicaraguan and American politics for many decades, as have you. Uh, do you feel a certain degree of satisfaction at this point that the speech you just gave uh, could have been delivered by at least a third of the American Democratic uh, congressional delegation uh, or even many members of the new uh, Biden administration? why the United States should consider Nicaragua an adversary. Nicaragua is the 
one country that interdicts the drug trade. Nicaragua is most successful. Just last week, $1,900,000,000 was confiscated on our northern border heading south. And the DEA has long worked with the Nicaraguan authorities to, to interdict the drugs here because here it works. By the same token, Nicaragua is the wall of contention for against the drug cartels and the Matas in Central America. If getting, if you look at the countries to the north of us, Honduras, uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico, or South Central Los Angeles where I grew up, the Maras are a very sad uh, reality as well as the influence of the, of the drug cartels. Nicaragua has neither, not the penetration of the drug cartels nor the Matas. It's the wall of contention. Then we have investment. U.S. investment is most welcome. Foreign investment is most welcome. We have the smallest economy, but the most open economy in Central America. The data shows that. And here we have uh, Walmart is making a fortune with stores of all types, the supermarket chains, Walmart itself, Pali, which sells uh, basic goods to the poorest people, Super Pali, which adds the white line onto it, Cargill, processes all of its chickens in, uh, in Nicaragua and sends them out to the rest of Central America. The Mexican firms of Su Carne, the, the, the meat packing company, or Lala, have their Central American operations here. Uh, the economy is private sector. The government uh, is, facilitates private sector development. And finally, one more point. Look at the caravans moving north. They are not Nicaraguans. They are Salvadorians, Hondurans, Guatemalans, and Mexicans, not Nicaraguans. So why destabilize the only stable country in Central America? Why destabilize the one country that has positive results? Why? Because you want the drug cartels to move in. You want the Matas to move in. You want the, the, the economy to fall apart. And... 500,000 people more marching for the southern border? No, I don't think so. But I do hope, I do hope that these uh, Democrats that you mentioned and others and Republicans start to come to realize some of the points that we're talking about now, Gideon, because things were much better in the 1980s when you had Senators Kennedy and Kerry leading the charge in 1984 and 1985, as you'll recall, to cut off the funding for the the Nicaraguan Contra, and to stop the uh, the funding of that by the U.S. government legally, which then led to the illegal funding and the uh, uh, Iran Contra scandal, which, by the way, Gideon was a spin. It was a spin to cover up the real underlying uh, uh, scandal, which was the CIA drug scandal, which Gary in the San Jose. Uh, Chronicle that you know, uh, and uh, subsequent films have exposed of the CIA introducing cocaine in the United States and it being converted into crack. Minister. And okay. they were converted into crack to finance the Contra after the official funding was cut off by Kennedy and Kerry and a vote of the U.S. Senate. So we do hope that things improve, and we should certainly hope that the Council of Foreign Relations, with your wise advice, will uh, we'll take heed to some of these points. From your lips to God's ears, as my people say. Uh, uh, we will now go to some spectacular videos uh, and we will, uh, we will see. Yanka, we're gonna put ourselves on mute and you'll do it. Dr. Frank Jurgen Richter, founder and chairman of the Horasis Global Visions Community. Honorable ministers, distinguished members of the forum, Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Frank Shervan Rector, founder and chairman of the Horasis Global Visions Community, for inviting me as a speaker at this panel discussion on a very timely and important topic. Let me also comment the excellent manner in which the event has been conducted in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Excellencies, the past year has been devastating for the entire world with the consequences of the pandemic reaching even the furthest corners of the world. Maldives and other small island developing states 
are among the worst affected, severely hampering our efforts to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The Sustainable Development Goals must be the answer to our global issues, such as this pandemic. The pandemic has made apparent the need for focused and efficient multilateral action. In this regard, the 2030 Agenda must be the overarching framework guiding our recovery and development. We must work together in addressing the trials faced in achieving the SDGs, considering that the pandemic demonstrated that no one country can face this crisis alone, ensuring that medium and long-term development goals achieved even during the pandemic will allow us to build back better, stronger and greener. With less than 10 years left to achieve the SDGs, the constable progress has been made in all areas of development. As we all know, the pace of progress observed in previous years is insufficient to fully meet the SDGs and targets by 2030. Time is therefore of the essence. We must accelerate momentum to implement the 2030 Agenda to its fullest. Excellencies, as a tourism-dependent de island nation, we are finding the path to recovery a lot harder. Our economy, dominated by the tourism sector, has collapsed beyond comprehension, recording a sharp decline since last year. Us Maldivians are children of the ocean. Our destinies are interconnected with the health and wealth of our ocean, which we rely on for transportation, food, and most importantly, tourism. It is also tied to our culture and way of life. Marine plastic pollution threatens this vast natural resource. A spike in the use of single-use plastics due to the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated this threat. Industries and the private sector play a crucial role in combating marine litter.
Hi there. Um, so now we're now we're back. Uh, I uh, so Sanda, I'm going to go to you now uh, with the following charge. Uh, uh, Paul was very clear about uh, not just uh, what they were doing right, as he uh, uh, argues, but what who else needs to do what and what needs to be done to move things forward. What are you as passionate about? in terms of what, who should do what now? Call out somebody like he did and say, or some force or some problem that needs to be solved. Because otherwise we're all getting into the sort of nice rhetoric and everyone wants to be better. What are the specific obstacles now that lie in the way of us doing better? And can we get beyond a Rodney King, you know, can't we all just get along? Uh, so so what are you, who are your specific vet noirs uh, in whatever way or, you know, uh, 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 or issues that you want to raise the consciousness of uh, as frankly. Yeah. So, so I'm going to call out business, not because business is not doing enough, but because there's the opportunity for business to do more and to do different. And I'm going to call out business on three specific areas. I think the first is, is climate. Um, a lot, I think all the speakers have spoken to the, to the climate crisis. I think we're at an unprecedented moment um, where business has the opportunity to really look at what economic growth versus uh, impact on climate looks like. And I think there's a real huge opportunity to really now look at minimizing you know, temperature rises, but also on the other side of the coin, new businesses taking up opportunity, looking more at adaptation and resilience and green growth trajectories. I'm going to call out business on the question of decent work. Um, uh, Michelle Bachelet spoke to this. I think ILO has estimated more than 255 million jobs lost. Now, we have the opportunity to look at how we can provide decent work opportunities for workers. I know a lot of our world has been taken over by digital, and, and that's true. But the point is, if we cannot look at how we can provide decent work for people who are out of work all around the world, I think we're going to then face another crisis which is the crisis of unemployment and the crisis of poverty. And we're slowly moving towards that. So we need to look at how we can bring this back. We need to recreate what the world of work looks like and the future of work. And hey, that applies to all of us because I'm very sure that perhaps you haven't stepped into what is a traditional office for a while. And, and what does work really mean anymore? And I think there's a huge opportunity to look at that. There's the opportunity to recreate broken supply chains. There's the opportunity to relook at what supply chains and value chains look like. I think there's the opportunity for big business to redefine purpose. And I really must call out business in a very positive way for the types of partnerships that we've seen in the context of this year. We've seen business partner with government and business partner with other entities in ways that hasn't happened before. Uh, able to break down barriers towards looking for solutions looking how to drive forward innovation. And I think that it's really been remarkable. And if you can have more of those partnerships that are you know, very quick to come to the table, quick to put the problem at the center and quick to put their resources at that center, I think is, is very important. Finally, I'm gonna call out business on the opportunity of addressing gender equality or gender inequality as the case may be. Um, as we know through COVID, women have been most adversely affected, primarily because they carry multiple loads in terms of work, caregiving, and other things. But also in a large part of the world, those who've lost jobs and lost income earning opportunities have been women. I think there's an opportunity to take a real look at how we can address that lack of social safety net, but also look at long-term sustainable opportunities for business. So for me, it's a, a call to business to seize the opportunity that we now have to address some of these fundamental issues and challenges that existed before, but now I think are clearer to us all more than ever. That's great. Thank you. I want to take both of you um, to a slightly different angle on this. This past year... great national uh, international crisis a human global crisis uh, has shown people at their worst and at their best the extraordinary healthcare workers around the globe who have 
uh, put themselves in harm's way to treat others, the extraordinary people who've just gone on to make life work, all the essential everything, the the doctors and scientists and uh, who have managed to keep life going and all the caregivers. So we've seen humanity at its worst and best, as you see in times of great crisis and stress. And I'm curious, the two of you, come this coming later in a life full of both accomplishment and disappointment, progress and backsliding, do you now feel hopeful? Do you feel distra- destroyed? Uh, Paul talked about the, the, the lost generation of developmental progress that's occurred. Um, uh, on the other hand, we now can see more clearly what needs to be done and the awareness of the problems that are there could produce a new kind of revolutionary consciousness uh, uh, and the wave, the, the peristaltic wave of history that he was describing in response to previous crises producing reforms sounded like it was the buildup to another wave of progressive reform across the board in the post crisis, post pandemic economy, both nationally in the United States and globally. And I wonder both whether you think that's going to happen. Are you optimistic or pessimistic? And, and, uh, or in general, where do you, where do you come out on this? Hard- the leaders of the IMF, the uh, regional development organizations, the World Bank, have all warned against the extreme inequality. And the pandemic made inequality that much greater. I think that if any lesson that comes out of the pandemic, it is that just like our own personal health is the basis for everything we do. Without our health, we have nothing. Public health is the basis of production, consumption, competitiveness, exports, education, sports, everything. Without public health, we have nothing. So we need to prioritize public health. And the countries that have most invested in public health, I will launch this as a hypothesis, Gideon, the countries that have most invested in public health and prioritized public health have done much better in the pandemic than those that had private health care systems ignoring public health. Nicaragua has free universal health care and the second poorest country in Latin America and the Caribbean. If Nicaragua can do it, why can't countries with many times the resources of Nicaragua? And that's one of the reasons why Nicaragua came out 2.6 deaths per 100,000 compared to 159 in the United Kingdom that has how much more resources than, uh, than, than Nicaragua. In my book, Equilibra, the philosophy and political economy of existence and extinction, which I hope has found my way into the stacks behind you. It, I argue that we have a, a certain that are cosmic and geological that we can do nothing about, the epidemiological and the anthropogenic. And the anthropogenic, the most immediate are nuclear weapons and climate change that are threats to our existence. But if we look at the epidemiological, I argue there in the book that we're in a battle, a battle between our immune systems and the rapidly mutating viruses and the uh, medicine resistant, uh, the antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria. You know, the vaccines can help and the antibodies can help. But the virus, they, they bounce back. They're mutating. How many variants have come out now? Which is why, and this is where the public health thing becomes universal, that this must be universal. Because if there's a reduct of, of the, of the co- new coronavirus anywhere in the world, if some countries don't get the vaccine or enough vaccine and it exists, it will continue mutating. It will continue uh, mutating. And the new variants will come back to bite us in the back. So I think uh, public health needs a reprioritization worldwide. And there's another factor in universal free health care. It's a great redistributor. And as I argued before, we need redistribution. We need to unwind the level of 1% of the population 
having 82% of the wealth according to Oxfam. That has to be unwound. You can't just keep adding to that and going and further and further and further. So public health is a great way to do it, and universal free health care, I think, is something that's needed, and not needed only in a few countries because public health is a universal issue. This virus, it's amazing how it's gone to every nook and cranny of the world, and how fast has it done that? You know, our first case in Nicaragua was 18 March. This is the one-year anniversary, and I've avoided that for one year, being 77, diabetic, hypertense, asthmatic, and I have to, I'm going to race now to see who comes first, the vaccine or the COVID-19. But uh, public health is essential for all of us. So, Paul, I, I associate everything up with everything you uh, just said. Uh, and and uh, again, from your lips to God's ears. Uh, uh, but I would just additionally point out that not only has this been a remarkably, you know, sped up year of disaster and destruction and chaos and 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 turmoil, but it's also uh, been a remarkably fast forwarded year in terms of the development of the vaccines, which nobody in anybody thought we would have this early. Nobody thought they'd be this good. Nobody thought the end would be in sight. So and and which was indeed not the result simply of public health, but the result of a private healthcare, pharmaceutical industry and development, working with government in a kind of partnership in a more uh, unified way. And and uh, uh, so, you know, not entirely unlike some of the... But, but the point is... But you're, you're the pandemic leader. after that. So we yes. have to reprioritize. Uh, I, I agreed, and we have to do both. The, the point is, it can be both, and it doesn't necessarily have to be another. And I guess that would be the point that I would turn to to, to Sana now, which is, uh, do you look, do you see more partnership coming out of this than we had before? Do you see up things, or, or are you so disheartened, uh, Zana, by what we, uh, the the lack of cooperation that we've seen nationally and and, and globally over the last? year uh, that it makes you, you know, your heart broken and you're no longer you know, optimistic. What, what is your take? Well, you know, my heart's not broken, but I'm anxious. Um, I'm anxious around the question of the vaccine. I'm anxious around vaccine equity. I think we're at an important moment where it, there is a solution in sight. And it would be great to ensure that everybody who does need to get the vaccine or wants to get the vaccine can get it. Because without that, I think you know, for a while, you know, we're, we're going to be stuck. We're going to be in a, in a mode of, of confinement, in a mode of inability to move. We may not be able to enter the workforce, enter the productive economy as we wish. So I'm anxious about that. But in terms of partnerships, I mean, I remain optimistic that some of the lessons learned, uh, as you said, where business has come together with government and private sector, and that some of those models can continue to be replicated. I think we've certainly learned a lot. And at the heart of it really is the fact that, you know, business, as we say, you can have business purpose and still remain, you know, productively profitable in business. And I think that that's important. But I think most importantly, the lesson that business should engage itself in the business of societal transformation, for me, is a key one to, to take away. So I'm anxious, but I'm also optimistic about what the opportunities could be. We don't have that much time left. So let me ask you both a, a sort of a, a big sort of last final question in a short time frame, which is we've been we're not, none of us are spring chickens. We've been working on these issues for a long time. We've seen the Millennium Development Goals. We've seen the SDGs. We'll hopefully, uh, if we get the vaccine or just keep ourselves safe, see the next ones, whatever they're going to be called. And my question to you is, at the end of all this, how much more do we know than we did? And what are the things that you think differently about now than you did 25 years ago? Well, one thing is that we have to learn how to deal with these things without ruining the economy. Nicaragua did not, um, did not close its economy or its public schools. They were always open. It did not confine its population. And it has dealt with this through public health. And as it turns out, Nicaragua had the greatest export expansion in Latin America and the Caribbean last year. It was plus 8% when the region was minus 13%. And that's because the Nicaraguan farmers were producing beans and cheese, and the Salvadorians, Hondurans, and Guatemalans, and U.S. ethnic market were eating that. So I think the world needs to learn how to deal with public health while not closing down. And the public schools weren't closed down. 
The private ones did. They went virtual. But the poor kids don't have the, infra the computer equipment nor the conditions in their households to do virtual education. So the public schools were not closed at any time. But it's very interesting now that in the U.S. and Europe, there's all kinds of studies of the great damage done to the children by taking them out of school and having them sit out a year, psychological, emotional, including suicides of, of adolescents. So I think we need to learn how to manage these situations. That's a big lesson without, um, without ruining the economy in the process. Got it. Sandra, your last words. You know, I was just going to say uh, very similar to what Paula said. We are greatly interlinked. You know, there's no singular development issue that stands alone. So it's always going to be a very delicate balancing act. But I think what is really important is the foundations of what we do need to be strong. And I'll go back to that public-private partnership. No one sector can do it alone. No one entity can do it alone. We've really got to, you know, moving forward, learn how to collaborate better, build on partnerships in the spirit of the sustainable development goals. Thank you. Thank you very much. All of you, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Abdul. Thank you, Frank, Jurgen, uh, all the folks at the Horasis community, Yanka as well, all of you who participated uh, onward and upward. And